Good morning, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and welcome back to Law and Crime. This is where we cover some of the most interesting live trials in the country today. And we have a very, very busy day for you. A lot to talk about. So let me get right into it. This is our first case of the day. I talked about it earlier this week. We're going to talk about it today because we believe it will start today. It's a case out of Ohio. It is the case of William Knight. Now, William Knight is on trial for shooting and killing an unarmed man named Keith Johnson. After going to his house with his family to seemingly recover a dirt bike that Mr. Knight believes was stolen from his son-in-law. An altercation ensued and Mr. Knight shot Johnson to death. Now the question becomes, was this self-defense or was this murder? Now we know this because this is what uh, the defense is claiming. They're claiming this is self-defense. Another interesting wrinkle in this case is William Knight was originally charged with involuntary manslaughter and those charges were up by a grand jury to murder. Today, what's going on right now, right as I talk to you, there is a planned jury view at 8.30 a.m. Uh, opening statements, we will believe, will begin right after that. So we're going to cover it here on Law and Crime. You don't want to miss anything. Now, to preview this case, we have a short package talking all about it. Take a look. The trial for the Streetsboro, Ohio man accused of shooting and killing an unarmed man in a dispute over a stolen dirt bike is set to begin next week. 64-year-old William Knight is charged with murder and assault stemming from an altercation with 24-year-old victim Keith Johnson. The dispute was over a dirt bike reportedly stolen in 2016 from Knight's son-in-law's garage. The victim had the pilfered bike in his possession and was attempting to sell it on Facebook, according to authorities. Knight and his family arranged a meeting with Johnson to discuss the sale of the bike when everything went terribly wrong. Knight alleges the victim tried to run over his daughter, Michelle, with the dirt bike when confronted with the stolen property. Ma'am, they tried to kill my daughter. My okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Did you just shoot the man? I had to. He's trying to, okay. he tried to run into my daughter. Okay, hold on, okay, okay. Johnson's family contends the bike was not stolen and that he purchased it from another seller. Is this a case of self-defense or cold-blooded murder? I'm Rachel Stockman for Law & Crime. Strange case. Let's try to make a little more sense of it. I want to bring on via Skype criminal defense attorney Mark Iglarsh. Mark, it's great to have you back here on the program. Always a pleasure, my friend. Now, uh, you have to explain this to me. The jury, before they even hear opening statements, they're going on a site visit. Is that normal protocol? And what are they looking to find there? What's the, the goal there for going to see the actual crime scene? Never heard of that ever. That's very unusual. Um, and what they're trying to see is the layout. Like, like, how could you have been in fear or were you shooting someone in cold blood and murder? Jesse, to me, the most interesting part of this case is that the defense lawyers originally uh, wanted to um, go the insanity route, which is really uh, the last resort. You, you do that because you got nothing. Um, and then they switched it after he was found competent to self-defense. That to me kind of suggests that the defense didn't necessarily believe that you know, self-defense was gonna work. Right, wasn't he deemed competent to stand trial and that was their first uh, hurdle for the defense trying to say that uh, this guy, look, he, he's competent to stand trial, now we have to go the self-defense route. And when you think about the self-defense route, the, a lot of the details of the case we don't know yet. We're going to learn more as the trial goes on, I should say begins. But when you just heard that, vi that audio recording that he made to the police, the idea that, he, that Mr. Johnson was charging at his daughter and you respond by using a firearm, just from that understanding alone, does that automatically say to you, self-defense, I can use a firearm? It doesn't, but I like those facts. If that really did happen, if he is charging at his daughter, if his daughter will testify that she feared for her life, if he's gonna testify to that, that's great. But in these cases, you gotta go to what the physical evidence shows. Where was the person hit? How far away from him was he? when when he was shot so you can say i was in fear for my daughter but if the guy's you know 20 feet away driving in the opposite direction and he's shot in the back hypothetically i don't know the facts that's why your viewers need to tune in and see what those facts are then you can't get away with shooting someone no i 100 percent agree with you and we can't not talk about the big issue here that the anybody who's been following this case or knows about is that he was originally, Mr. Knight was originally charged with involuntary manslaughter, and there were protests. Let's not forget, Mr. Knight is white. 
and Mr. Johnson is African American. And you know that there's racial tensions involved in this kind of case. The grand jury upped those charges. Do you think it was a, a mount from the evidence that was happening, or was there some sort of pressure, uh, you think, in the community as well? I think if the grand jury upped the charges, it's because there's a prosecutor that appeared in front of the grand jury and not only suggested it, but passionately requested it. And I think that it has a lot to do with pressure from the community, yes. All right, let me ask you the million dollar question now. If you were selecting this jury as the defense, you're representing Mr. Knight, who do you want on that jury? Hmm. Well, <laughs> we're being honest here, right? We're being honest. That's what we I do want, here. I don't want anyone to sympathize with the alleged victim. So anyone who could sympathize. Now, you legally cannot do something like that. Um, you know, get rid of someone because they might sympathize with the victim. So you've got to come up with other reasons and you ask questions and try to discern um, why it is that they won't be fair for other reasons and you, you, you get rid of those jurors. That's the answer. If anyone's saying anything else, they're, they're, they're full of it. And if you're the prosecutor, who do you want on that jury? People who own gut, well, prosecutors, no, that's what I wanted on that, let's see. Right, who do I want on the jury? Um, I want people who are afraid of guns, don't own guns, um, who, um, you know, would somehow sympathize with the alleged victim. And the facts of this case are really strange. This is all over a dirt bike that was allegedly stolen. We'll obviously learn more about it. The Johnson family said that Mr. Johnson didn't even know that the bike was stolen if it was, in fact, stolen. So we'll learn more about the details of it. It's a strange one, Mark. Whether he did it or not, to me, I, I would immediately say as a prosecutor, is irrelevant. Whether he stole it or not, the issue is at the time that he was shot, did he create fear, reasonable fear that, that his daughter was going to be harmed? I don't care if he, he, he was with OJ when he, when he killed two people and, and, and assisted. That's not the issue. That's exactly right. You've got to focus really on the main point here, the main legal point. And that's what we're going to do here as we learn more about this case. And again, as soon as we have opening statements, we'll make sure to go live into the courtroom. Mark, stand by. want to preview some other cases that we're covering here. So I want to let everybody know, as you know, we've been covering the Claude Tex MacGyver case out of Atlanta. This prominent attorney who's on trial for killing his wife. He's claiming it was an accident. He shot her from the back seat of a moving car. He said the gun went off by accident. The prosecution is saying... Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. He had a financial motive. He had to lo a lot to gain by killing her, and this was an intentional shooting. We've been covering it all last week, the week before. It is on break this week. Trial is not in session, but it will continue on. It will begin again on Monday, and we are going to cover it here on Law & Crime, so you don't want to miss anything. Now, I have to tell you about another case that we're going to be hopefully covering, and this is not a criminal case. No, 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 no. This is a civil case, but I'm sure you've heard about it. It's out of Las Vegas, that's right, and it concerns magician David Copperfield. That's right, a man named Gavin Cox was an audience member in magician David Copperfield's show. He was asked to be a part of a trick, and during that trick, he got injured. And now he is suing David Copperfield and MGM Grand that hosted the show. So this is an interesting civil case. We have a short preview of that one as well, and we believe it might start as soon as today. So let's take a look at that short package. World-famous delusionist David Copperfield might be forced to break the cardinal rule of magic and reveal the secrets of his illusions in open court. Copperfield is being sued in Las Vegas civil court by 57-year-old Gavin Cox, who claims he was injured during a 2013 Copperfield show in Las Vegas. The British tourist, who once cooked for British royalty, claims he fell and struck his head on the ground after tripping over construction debris as one of Copperfield's assistants whisked him and other audience members through a dark secret passageway during the disappearing stunt. Cox claims he suffered brain trauma and is forced to wear an oxygen lung at night because he stops breathing when he's asleep. He's seeking punitive damages from Copperfield and MGM for alleged negligence. The illusionist and hotel strongly deny all claims, stating Cox's injuries were pre-existing and or unrelated medical conditions. This is Aaron Keller for the Law and Crime Network. Well, Mr. Copperfield's not going to be able to disappear from this one. 
I thought that was a good touch. But yes, so we're going to have to see if the trial begins today. And if it does, we're going to go right into that courtroom. We don't want you to miss anything, including maybe we might learn some magic tricks behind the way. So you want to want to follow that one here on Law and Crime. Now, our main focus today, before we go into either the Copperfield or Knight trials, is to recap an amazing trial that we covered as well. We talked about it a little bit yesterday, and we're going to now get into the nitty gritty of it. It is the Leon Jacob case out of Texas, this former Houston doctor who was on trial for two counts of solicitation of capital murder. That's right, he tried to hire a hitman to kill not only his ex-girlfriend, Megan Vericos, but his new girlfriend's ex-husband, Marion Mac McDaniel. Unfortunately for Mr. Jacob, that person was an undercover police officer. And now he was on trial for these two counts. And what we're going to play for you now this morning before trial begins, and I'm keeping a very careful eye on the courtroom, is I want to play you the testimony of Leon Jacob, the defendant himself, when he tried to say, I never asked anybody to kill anybody. And when we come back, Mark and I are going to talk all about it. Take a look. State your name. Who, who was Valerie McDaniel? Well, to me or just in general? No, well, let's talk about it in general. Uh, Valerie McDaniel was a, uh, a woman who uh, was a veterinarian and... Um, my girlfriend, uh, or common law wife, I guess, if we qualified for that, uh, towards the end of her death, she uh, was a lot of things. I, I don't really sure what you're asking. All right. Well, uh, to you personally, you were together romantically, correct? Yes. Uh, for how long a period of time? Um, we lived together for about three or two and a half months, uh, but we had been romantically involved for quite some time, uh, more than that. How much time, approximately? Um, probably a couple of years. All right. Now, um... Can I re retract my last statement? It was not a continuous uh, relationship. We had had an interlude uh, in 2014, and then there was a long break where we were just friends. And then, you know, after um, I broke up with my former girlfriend, we rekindled the romantic rela part of the relationship. Okay. And your former girlfriend was who? Uh, a woman by the name of Megan Louise Vericus. All right. And you've heard Megan testify in this court? I have. All right. Now, uh, tell the ladies and gentlemen of this jury uh, about your relationship with Megan. When did you start? We met um, during my divorce proceedings. I lived in a couple of hotels in Pittsburgh. I lived in the Wyndham Grand for quite some time, and I decided to move hotels, and I was given a referral uh, to a place called the Cambria Suites, uh, which is right next to the console center where the penguins play, and it, I checked in there, um, I think, in the beginning of uh, 2014, sometime in early January and I met Megan there. You're watching Leon Jacob, the defendant, in his own case, taking the stand and saying that he did not intend for anyone to get killed. He didn't want to hire anyone to be harmed or hurt. But do you believe him? Let's bring in again Mark Iglarsh. Mark, you're a good judge of character. We just are starting the testimony of Leon Jacob. You, you were sitting on the jury. What do you make of this guy? Well, I don't think he's likable. I don't think the jurors are thinking that that's a guy that I've ever hung out with. I think that the biggest mistake that the defense has in this case is that they haven't listed and will not be calling one particular expert that I would call if I was defending the case. And you've mentioned the name earlier in your broadcast, and that's David Copperfield, because that's the guy that you need in this case to make those audio tapes disappear, Jesse. Once you have someone caught on tape, once you have someone caught in audio recordings, 
Correct me if I'm wrong, that is very hard to argue away. It points, it puts him in a box. He can't say he wasn't talking to these individuals. He can't right. say that he wasn't planning something. Now he has to f kind of explain his way out of it, and it becomes a really uphill battle for the defense. It's all state of mind. Okay, I said these things, but here's what I really meant. So there were some things that helped him. He did say, I don't want her harmed, I don't want her harmed, I don't want her harmed, if it can be helped. But you know what, if, if push comes to shove, then you do what you gotta do. Well, you're done, that's it. So in other words, it doesn't matter if he didn't use the magic words, I don't want anybody killed. When you look at the context of his entire conversation, you could say, I know what he was intending to do. So here's my other question. How much in these kinds of cases does it matter what the impression of other people were? So when you look at the first person that he tried to hire as um, he thought he was a private investigator, but he was really a con man, took his money. And then you look at the undercover police officer. How much is it important to understand? Well, when I was speaking to Leon Jacob, my impression was he wanted them dead. How important is it in these kinds of cases? I'm glad you brought that up. It, it is not the nail in the coffin but it's two strikes against the defendant who really isn't presumed to be innocent. Nobody really believes that. That's for, for cheesy dramas on TV. They believe that if he's sitting in that chair, he must have done something. He hears the audio tape. That's probably strike two and three quarters. And then when you hear from anyone who is there, and they have no reason to lie and want to send a guy away for life, and he looks at the jurors in the eyes and says, there is no doubt in my mind that everything from beginning to end suggested this guy was hell-bent on doing what it is he said on audio tape, which is, you know, I, I want her harmed. Well, that hurts. I mean, he is accused of being a cold, calculated man, and when you see him on the stand, it's hard to not see a person who's calculated and manipulative and someone who's trying to ve very carefully answer each question. In fact, later on in our broadcast, when we continue on showing his testimony, he said, huh, how should I answer this? So when you see that, shouldn't his defense attorney say, it's really important that you come off as a human being? Okay, I've been there, done that a million times. First of all, I rarely like to put on a defense case. I love to tell jurors that the state has the exclusive burden of proof and that we're not going to do anything because we have the constitutional right not to have to do so. That's really an excuse for my client is absolute garbage. And no matter how much mayonnaise I add to that client, I'm going to, you know, you know what I'm saying? So you, you can only do so much. There's some clients that that are not going to come across very likable. He actually, on the scale of of the type of clients I've gotten, you know, he's on the higher end, meaning he's not hateable. He's not, you know, he's just not likable. And, and that's something you have to work with when you have a defense that only he can, can put forward. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, we have a lot to show of his testimony, including when he got a little defensive under cross-examination. But let's continue playing his direct examination. And as always, Mark and I have a lot to discuss with this case. Take a look. Tell the ladies and gentlemen of this jury uh, about uh, Mac McDaniel. Had you ever met him? I met him a couple of times um, when he lived next door to my mother. Uh, I think once when I came down to visit, and then once when I moved down here. I stayed with my mother for, I moved, I moved back to, um, to Houston. In 2014, I, I stayed with my mother for a couple of weeks, uh, maybe three or four weeks, actually, maybe more like a month. And um, I had run into him a couple of times on the street. No real interactions, just a friendly, high neighbor, you know, kind of thing. So you didn't socialize with him? Absolutely not. And you didn't uh, uh, go to his employment or vice versa? No, I was... Uh, I knew nothing about him. I'm at sorry? The, at the time, I knew nothing about him except for he was supposedly um, Valerie's husband, although he was seemed to never be around very much. Um, the few times I did see him, he drove into the house and would leave shortly thereafter. Okay. And um, was he married at the time? To Valerie, yes. Okay. Now, tell the ladies and gentlemen of this jury uh, about the uh, split 
the initial split that you had with Megan? We. What happened? I'll, I'll get there. Um, we had had a, a pretty heated argument uh, the night of January 12th of 2017. Um, the argument started over the fact that um, sort of by accident I had discovered that she had been moving money out of our uh, joint checking account for quite some time um, into somewhere else or she was taking cash uh, withdrawals and I confronted her about that and we had a you know a really bad fight I, approximately how much money did you approximately it was several thousand dollars I, I really hadn't discovered a lot at that time because you know it was kind of shocking to me that what was going on I have since after that found you know more but the initial thing that took my attention was it was a five hundred dollar paycheck that she wrote to herself out of our personal account on um, January 5th of uh, 2017 um, subsequently the day I came back from visiting my children in Chicago she picked me up at the airport and you know things seemed fine it's just, uh, go ahead well, well, I'm sorry. I sustained the objection. So yes, I understand. Uh, you indicated that things seemed fine between you and Megan. Yes. You know, we had this fight, but um, I, prior to the fight, I had discovered that she had been taking money out of our joint checking account, and it was, you know, quite upsetting that I had discovered that. And that, that taking their, those deposits or withdrawals was without your knowledge at the time it happened and without your consent? Yes. It was a joint checking account. She had the right to do that. I have to preface that the statement with that. But Megan had handled all the, the bills. She was she was very responsible with paying bills on time and you know paying our rent on time. And uh, I, I really did not get involved in the finances too much. We both put money into the account, but I sort of was very happy to let her stay out, or for myself to stay out of that. She was very organized when it came to our finances. So, you know, I trusted her. It was, I found out sort of by accident. So explain, question and answer, please. What did you find out by accident? I had put on our home computer and she had been logged into um, our banking account. And when it, the screen, I saw the screen, I just clicked on some checks. I, don't, I was just looking at the stuff that was on there, and I, I noticed the check that she had written to herself. It was bizarre. And did you have an argument about that? Yes, that's what the argument, precipitated the argument, yes. All right, and we've heard uh, testimony that she moved out. She left that evening. She left all of her belongings there, um, so I, she didn't move out that night. Um, okay. In fact, I moved all my stuff out about four days later. And did you also move some of her stuff out? No, I left her clothes, you know, anything that she, was hers, I, I left there as far as I didn't touch any of her clothes or any, any of her toiletries or anything. I took my clothing and I took our furniture. At a later time, you got back together with her, correct? No. Not after January 12th. All right. We're trying to understand the relationship here in the Leon Jacob case. Again, a former Houston doctor who was on trial for two counts of solicitation of capital murder, trying to hire a hitman to kill not only his ex-girlfriend, but his new girlfriend's ex-husband. And uh, as we watch this man take the stand, we do have a lot of questions there. But I do want to let our viewers know the reason we are playing this and recapping it right now. We want everybody to be updated about this case, but we are also patiently waiting for the Ohio v. William Knight case to begin. This, again, is a case out of Ohio where a man is on trial for shooting and killing an unarmed man named Keith John by going to his house to recover what he thought was a stolen dirt bike, a dirt bike that he said belonged to his son-in-law. An altercation ensued, shots were fired, Johnson was killed. Now, Mr. Knight is claiming self-defense. What's happening right now is the jury is on a site visit, and we believe opening statements will begin later on today. As soon as they do, we'll make sure to cover it here on Law and Crime. We don't want you
want you to miss anything. But as we wait for the William Knight case, we do want to talk about the Jacob case because it's really a bizarre case and a really strange one and, and one that is we try to make sense of because the facts are so unbelievable. Uh, but let's again bring in criminal defense attorney Mark Eiglarsh. Mark, here's my question to you, okay? You got this guy, and we, we hear it so often in these solicitation for capital murder cases. Some people say doing this, trying to hire someone to kill someone else, is even worse than if you tried to do it yourself. And we see a prevalence of these kinds of cases happening so much. I mean, down in Florida, we saw the Dahlia DiPolito case. Why are we seeing these kinds of cases? Interesting you brought up Dahlia DiPolito. I was her lawyer for a year until I got out of the case. Um, and I've tried to avoid bringing up that case. But Sorry, uh, let's not talk about it, but let's say okay. in, the, in the grand scheme of things. That's okay. It's just interesting that you brought that up. But, but it does bring to mind that case. But your question was, uh, the premise had me concerned. People believe that hiring someone to do it is worse than doing it yourself. Are we comfortable with that? initial statement? Well, I've heard people say that. People in this case have said, uh, who've been analyzing it, and people who have actually been in the case, I think it was Leon Jacobs' mother might have said it to him uh, in a jailhouse recording. She said, you know, hiring someone to do this is even worse than actually doing it yourself. And I've you heard that criticism that? before, and I'm curious about your thoughts on it. Well, wait, I want to ask you, do you believe that? Do you no, believe I that think I, I think they're both equally bad. <laughs> I think it's equal. if you want someone to die, whether you want to do it yourself or hire someone to do it, I think it's just what instrument you want to use to make it happen. And I think I'm both are you. bad, but it's interesting when you see a case like this, we have this doctor who didn't want to do the dirty work and wanted to right. have the risk put on somebody else. Correct. All right, so now, why we, now that we're done with that premise, what was the question? Well, my question is, why do we see a lot of these cases? Is, is it my imagination or are more of them happening? And I'm, or is it just we're covering more of them? I think you're covering. I think that they're very interested in cases. I don't know if they're happening, happening with greater frequency. Um, I, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. Great question. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Is this a situation where if he wanted to stop this, okay? He is asked on cross-examination, we'll play it later on, if you, did you ever at one point say, I don't want to go through with this, this has gone far enough, let's stop it? And he goes, no, not that I recall. Under the, under the yeah. law, can you stop, if you put it into motion, can you stop it at a certain point and you'll get off the hook? Uh, it depends upon the facts. There is something called a withdraw from the conspiracy or, you know, th th there's an argument to be made, but the prosecutors asked that question because they knew damn well there was none of that. There was no evidence. They had the audio recordings. They had the witnesses to combat that. They just wanted to make it super clear that at no point from the time that he said, look, if you got to do it that way, you got to harm her. OK, so be it. That after that point, he never changed his mind. I'm trying to understand a lot of his behavior and, you know, you, you try to approach people to take care of something. But the idea that he even wanted to go out and if you want to take to believe his premise, which is what he's about to get into, that he just wanted to hire someone to maybe scare Megan or bring her to a location where he could talk to her. Doesn't he realize that that's bad enough? I mean, he, he according to him, he didn't want her to testify in a case about him regarding domestic abuse. So when, isn't his own fault, I mean, we could all agree, but isn't his own fault for himself to know that as soon as you put the events in motion, this is where it could end up? Yes, but Jesse, you said it earlier. He put himself in a box, right? You can't, the minute he made those statements, he had to acknowledge he made those statements. It's kind of like my client, I'll pick one, uh, in federal court, who, when he was referring to, I need 50 of your best quality paint cans, and he said, not like last time, I need, I need really good quality paint. Everyone knew he wasn't talking about paint, but he had to say, no, I really meant paint and explain all that. Um, so he's locked into, by the way, it was kilos of, um, I think it was ecstasy or cocaine, I forget what it is. But, but in this particular case, he's locked into it. He physically met with this person. He has to give a reason why he did it. And no matter how bad it is, he has to say, but it wasn't what the prosecutors were alleging. He, he's stuck. He's got to give that explanation. So as our viewers watch the defense questioning him, what it, what's their tactic here? What are they trying to do exactly? And, and the format of their questions, starting from the beginning to what actually happened, what, what, if you can provide some guidance for our viewers as they watch this. 
Well, I feel for the defense because, again, he didn't create the facts. He's handed the facts. He was hired on the case. And I'm sure when he heard that audio tape, he went, oh, boy, oh, boy. Looks like I'm going to come in second place on this one. But, you know, my job as a defense lawyer is to do all that I can to get the best possible outcome. I bet that in their minds, the defense thought it's a no-brainer. We're going to lose this case, but let's give it a shot. And then ultimately, jurors decide the sentencing, and we're going to push for probation. So it's possible that they're already thinking of phase two when he's being interviewed here on the stand, uh, on direct. Let's humanize him. Let's have him talk and, and be relatable. It's hard for jurors to put away somebody for life who they can relate to. So that's what they're hoping that they're accomplishing, I think. And I'm not suggesting the defense knew that they were going to lose, but maybe they thought they had a chance of getting one or two jurors to buy into reasonable doubt, but this was a tough case. And did you think, and I haven't heard it so much, we'll continue to listen, but I didn't get the flavor of trying to bash the victim in the sense that when I say the victim, I'm Megan in this case, because the idea could have been, you know what, she broke his heart and he was heartbroken. And I've seen this happen in other trials before where you try to justify the behavior of someone. I didn't hear that that much in this one, but what did you make of it? Because, no, I agree with you, because it could backfire. You want to be careful. I go after the alleged victim when I've got good stuff on the alleged victim. If I don't, I stay away from it because that gives prosecutors such passion, such energy like they didn't have before. Right. Yeah. Mark, stand by. There's so much to discuss with him taking the stand and this case in general. I want to continue playing for you the testimony of Leon Jacob. Take a look. Now, uh, let's go to the uh, whole allegation of solicitation of capital murder. Okay. Um, you know who the party is that you're accused of soliciting to murder. Are you talking about the undercover officer? Correct. Yes. All right. Now, um, were you a party to conversations with the undercover officer? Yes. And do you know whether or not those record? were you told that they were being recorded? I had no idea they were being recorded at the time I had the conversations with him. When was the first time you had a conversation with the undercover officer? I met him at the Olive Garden on, um, I think it was March 7th of uh, 2017. All right. Tell me about that meeting that's been talked about a lot. Tell me your version of the meeting. Judge, I'm going to check this calls for a narrative. It does. What's the matter, please? What, uh, what was the first time at the Olive Garden when you met with the undercover officer? Outside of the restaurant, um, I had, Valerie and I had arrived before they did, so we we were sitting by a booth I could see out to the front, and when they arrived, I met them, I think, outside in the front and showed them where we were sitting. Um, I met him either right there or right after he got into the restaurant. What was the purpose of that meeting from your perspective? It was to it was to finalize some plans that I had had with um, somebody I thought to be a private investigator um, who we called Zach or Abraham, uh, who has been identified in court here as um, Motaz Aziz. Um, he had told Valerie and I that some of the things that we had discussed with him, that he had become too close to us. Sustained. Sorry. Now, we've heard testimony about there being money that had been, um, I believe, transmitted to Megan or to the undercover officer. Uh, what was the purpose of giving the money to the undercover officer as far as Megan's concerned? It had nothing to do with Megan um, at all. all right. well, who did it have to deal with? It had to do with an advance payment on what Valerie and the undercover officer had agreed upon 
because of expenses that he needed to hotel and whatnot. And for the time that he was there, he had explained to me that. Um, well, going into your say. It had nothing to do with monies to Megan for her expenses to leave, correct? No, that had been paid um, previously to Aziz. And how much money was paid to Aziz? He was given um, initially a $2,500 payment for the initial investigation that I had hired him to do. Um, he was given an additional five thousand uh, dollars for continued expenses during that investigation. He was given a little over five thousand dollars for a moving company receipt that he had showed me um, that it arranged for Megan's stuff to be moved um, back to Pittsburgh. He had given me a receipt for a Continental Airlines ticket, uh, first class one way that was a little over seven hundred and change I gave him a thousand dollars for that and then he had told me that he thought it was appropriate to give Megan some money to restart her life in Pittsburgh and I asked him how much um, and the sum of ten thousand dollars in cash was um, agreed upon which he received and the ten thousand went to Aziz as opposed to Megan that was how it was arranged yes I was under the impression that Aziz was uh, in contact with Megan um, on a semi-regular basis. Well, but my question is, was the money given to Aziz for Aziz or to be given to Megan? It was to be given to Megan. The monies that were given to Aziz for Aziz were the initial $2,500 that he received plus the additional $5,000 for what I thought were his services. Do you know if, in fact, he gave money to Megan for this purpose? I have learned um, in testimony f that we've heard in court that that did not occur. It what? It did not occur. You're watching the Leon Jacob case, the defendant taking the stand in his own defense. There's so much to analyze in this case. Let's bring in again Mark Iglarsh. Mark, we see this, um, and, and my question to you uh, for this is, and one of the sad parts about the case but also a unique part is valerie mcdaniel who's his ex-girlfriend who was also arrested uh with jacob she committed suicide in the days after her arrest if she hadn't died and they were both on trial for solicitation of capital murder do you imagine a scenario where they might have been blaming one another as oh i was just following his lead oh i was just following her lead yeah that's possible but it's hard for me to envision a different scenario other than the state cutting her an extraordinary deal to get her to testify against him. That's how I see it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. when you heard that she died, um, how does that play into this kind of case? Is it, a, is it a consciousness of guilt kind of thing? You know, she committed suicide right after the days of the arrest. Then again, when somebody gets arrested, you know, it's a different kind of scenario than other people. Um, you know, the arrest itself could have driven her to this. I could not say what drove her to this, but the idea of consciousness of guilt, that's a term that we keep throwing around. How did you think that played into this case? When I heard that she killed herself, it harkens back to that feeling that I got when OJ put the gun to his head, you know? Um, I was like, not sure about what had happened, but when, when he's threatening to kill himself, that to me is consciousness of guilt, not always, but, but generally. And I think that she believed that the writing was on the wall and she didn't want to spend the rest of her life in a cage. So she took herself out. The family of Valerie um, has said that they feel she's a victim in this case. And even her father, we heard a little bit of testimony earlier in this case, father didn't want her to have anything to do with Jacob. And they feel that he, she was pressured into this and it was his fault she ultimately died. When you see these kinds of cases, you look at the victims and the victims can be multiple people. It's not just the two people who stage their own, uh, uh, stage their own kidnapping and murder. I'm talking about Va um, Megan uh, Vericas as well as uh, Mac McDaniel. But you also you look at the people that were affected by this, the, the Valerie's family. You look at um, even Mr. Kubash, who was the, um, you know, the person that actually unraveled this whole plot. He was manipulated in a way. So when you see these cases, it, it's interesting from, I think, my perspective, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts, when there's multiple victims outside of the two people we're talking about. 
There usually is. Uh, certainly families are affected. I would expect nothing less from a family to point the finger at someone else other than their own daughter, for example, in this case. Um, and it's very easy to say that he was a horrible influence. And, you know, what, what they really should be saying is, okay, he was a horrible influence, but because of that, our daughter made some seriously bad slash criminal choices. But that's not something that, that many families can, can do. Yeah, and so hopefully something not a lot of families have to think about either. Uh, the, another interesting aspect of this case and a unique aspect is the staged kidnapping photos. The police worked with Megan. They worked with Mac. I'm making it look like they were kidnapped and killed. Now, I am not experienced in this area of law, but when police set up these kind of um, staged photos to sort of get that defendant, is that a common practice? Do you see that happening more with law enforcement and being used in evidence in courts? Unfortunately, no, they should do it. It really does put a nail in the coffin because then you get the reaction. It eliminates uh, the argument that, uh, oh, wait, wait, this isn't what I intended. So I love when they go that extra step. And on a personal level, I love it because that's when Hollywood meets with, you know, these cases, when they go to that extra mile. Look at that. Wow, that photo's, I mean, extraordinary. I mean, look at that. That's yeah, no, it, if I saw this, uh, I would say this is a, these are crime scene photos. That's exactly and what the, it looks like. And the words and the actions after the perpetrator, alleged perpetrator, sees those photographs, to me, is money. If they're breaking out with, no, what have you done? I just hired you to do something else. What is this? Then you've got a defense. Anything short of that, which is what pretty much happens almost every time, is, you know, guilt. Oh, absolutely. And I think we talked about it earlier is because this is obviously, thankfully, no one was killed. But when you have a case where you're looking at solicitation of capital murder, obviously we don't want the crime to be completed. But if you can take it to that finish stage where the people look like they're actually dead, then mm -hmm. you can, like you said, you get, you get the whole scenario from beginning to end for, um, for Mr. Jacob. And when you look at the money that he paid for this, I am not, again, I'm not an expert in soliciting uh, capital murder, hiring a hitman, anything like that. When you look at the amount of money that he paid, yes. what yes. does that tell you? Did he yes. not know what was going on? Yeah, listen, th that's a lot of money. You know, I didn't buy it as he was saying it. Um, th that, that's not consistent with what he's claiming. Um, and, you know, part of the reason why I like when prosecutors are assisting with investigations is because they know what needs to be proven in court. They know the angles that the defense lawyers are going to play. And I'm guessing um, reasonably that a prosecutor was helping with this investigation and they probably directed law enforcement, look, go ahead and stage this thing. This is what we need. Um, that's, that's, that's where that becomes very helpful. So, in other words, it's a common tactic for the prosecution, the law enforcement. They know they have a rock-solid case, or they know they'll have a rock-solid case, and they work together to actually make this happen. Absolutely. And, and I like it, too, because if I ever have an innocent client, and it does happen, Jesse, every now and then, um, I like when a prosecutor's involved. I'll go over the law enforcement officer's head and talk to the prosecutor and say, listen, they already believe my client's guilty, but please objectively look at this evidence. And there have been times where they have instructed law enforcement to, to back down. They'll be diplomatic and say, OK, maybe you have probable cause, but there's no way I can prove this beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. That elevated higher burden, it's a nice way of saying to the cop, you know, that, that just don't go forward. It's not your fault. It's just how the law is. But oftentimes it is the cop's fault. Like, no, you, you got the wrong person here or it's just, just not enough evidence. Yeah, you said it well. We covered a lot of cases here with the defense will tack attack, excuse me, the DA's office or the law enforcement said, they thought my client was guilty from the first hour in. They never looked for other people. They didn't right. do a thorough job. Unfortunately for Mr. Jacob, it's probably not the case right here. We kind of see what's been happening. Now, Mark, right. I know we have to let you go. Any final thoughts about this case? Well, again, People always talk about how, you know, there's certain defense lawyers who have never lost a case. I, I don't believe that. Or those are lawyers who just, you know, take very selective cases. This case 
you know, again, you need Houdini, you needed Copperfield to make those tapes go away. I feel for the defense lawyer who, again, had to do what he had to do. And I really do believe he was fighting for the guy's life on the back end and trying to simply just, you know, maybe get the jury to consider probation or something other than a life sentence. Very well said. Very well said. Mark Iglosh, thanks for joining us. Take care, my friend. Thank you, Jess. Take care. All right, everybody, we are going to continue playing for you the Leon Jacob testimony. And again, as soon as we have a live feed or an update in the Ohio case of William Knight, we will make sure to go to it. We don't want you to miss anything from that courtroom. I will turn directly to it. But before we do, we got to talk about Leon Jacob. Let's continue with some of his direct examination. 